Hi guys, so we're back with another critical reasoning webinar. Today we'll talk about flaw in reasoning questions. I hope you've gone through the video and the module. So uh, you would know the various kind of flaws that there are, right? So uh, I'm sure that you're comfortable with that. So today we'll uh, do, discuss some interesting questions. But before we start with that, let me just talk about what is the difference between flaw in reasoning versus weakened questions, because that comes out quite often. Yeah, A lot of people ask about what is the difference between them. So look, they are different, first of all. Yeah, um, An option that you would choose for weakened question is not what you would choose for flaw in reasoning. Of course, flaw in reasoning is where, you know, the author is giving you the data and the conclusion. So you have to say, and of course, it's a flawed uh, argument. So um, that particular data does not merit that particular conclusion. So you have to point out why it is so, why the author's data does not merit that conclusion. So for example, he could have used circular reasoning, right? Or he could have uh, used a few examples to generalize, etc. right? We, we've discussed those various types of errors that are there. All right, various types of flaws that are there. Uh, and what is a weakened question? A weakened question is where you yourself give data, which is against the conclusion. So you're trying to weaken the conclusion in that way, right? You're not pointing out the flaw of the author. You're figuring out what the conclusion is and then giving new data, which opposes that particular conclusion. So, you know, I often talk about how these are two sides of a debate, right? So um, I say in strength and weaken questions, think about a debate that is going on. And uh, for example, in strength and questions, you are on the side of the team, which is supporting the conclusion. Whereas in weaken questions, you're on in that team, which is opposing the conclusion. So then when you're strengthening it, you will give another point why the conclusion is correct. Whereas when you're opposing it, you will give some data, some info, some point why the conclusion may not hold, right? Then in flaw in reasoning questions, you know, it's, um, let's say that you're playing the role of a moderator, for example, or maybe a scorekeeper, where when someone makes a point, you're thinking, well, is this point valid? Or, you know, the person has actually used examples like this and generalized from these two examples, but then does it really work? Or for example, um, you know, the data he gave was about averages and now he's concluding that this person also fits the bill. Does that really work? Or for example, if you know not the scorekeeper or the moderator, think about it that if you are in the opposing team, this is what you're going to say in the rebuttal, right? Not while you're presenting your own side. This is what you will say in the rebuttal that you will tell them, you know what, I do get this point of yours, but this is where you are wrong, right? This point does not lead to this conclusion because, right? So this is the difference between the two questions. Now, uh, let's take some examples. Let's take some questions and uh, proceed. Take a look at this now. So surveys show that every year, only 10% of cigarette smokers switch brands. Okay, 10% of cigarette smokers. So let's say if there are 100 people. And only 10% of them switch brands. So only 10 switch brands. And let's say we have four brands. Say A, B, C, and D. Yeah. And uh, let's say each one has a different market share. Say 10% and 20% and 30% and now 40%. Right? Yet the manufacturers have been spending an amount equal to 10% of their gross receipts on cigarette promotion in magazines. So... Only 10% people out of the 100 smokers are going to switch brands, yet these manufacturers, they have been spending 10% of their revenues on marketing, on promotions. All right. It follows from these figures that inducing cigarette smokers to switch brands did not pay. Okay, why, why does the argument say that? That, um, you know, these figures indicate that they do not pay. Okay, so... Look, 10 people switch brands, right? So then if we divide them evenly according to uh, what market share each person has, let's say four people came to D that day, that year, because of their promotion. 10% people, so 10% of these, out of these 10, you know, D will get four, then C will get three, B will get two, and A will get one, right? Splitting them evenly between the four as per their market share. So then we would get four new people, but B also spends 10% of its gross revenues on cigarette promotion. So then think about it. You know, let's say if D earns $1.40, $1 per person, right? 
So out of this dollar four, D spends in promotion. And four is the number of people that actually came. So basically, whatever D gained by promotion seems that D has already spent that in the promotion. So that is why it seems, that is why the author says that it follows from these figures that inducing cigarette smokers to switch brands did not pay. Like whatever, uh, you know, it, since only 10% people were switching, only 10% people are coming and the company is winning 10% of its uh, sales. So basically, whatever it is earning, it is uh, selling that and, um, you know, spending that in promotions, right? So then the effect of the promotion is the same as the cost of the promotion. So what is the point? And that cigarette companies would have been no worse off hmm, economically if they had dropped their advertising. So for example, when this means that in case D would have got 36 people, you know, the four people would not have switched and joined D. And D would have earned what dollar thirty six because we're assuming D is earning dollar one from each person, right? So then, well, kind of makes sense, isn't it? What he's saying, if you know, we follow this train of thought, then we now understand what the author wants to say. Now, of the following, the best criticism of the conclusion that inducing cigarette smokers to switch brands did not pay is that the conclusion is based on. Okay, first of all. What is the conclusion? We know that it follows from these figures that inducing cigarette smokers to switch brands did not pay. And this has been repeated over here as well. So anyway, we have no confusion. Yeah. Now there is a flaw over here in the reasoning of the question. Now in flaw and reasoning questions, it often pays to pre-think in case you, know, you want to give yourself 10, 15 minutes. And once you do enough questions, that will automatically come to your mind because there are those you know, common flaws that we talk about, right? That the, the ones that we've discussed in the module, those flaws are quite common. They keep on repeating. So you start identifying them after a while, right? So here, look, what is the flaw here? So what I'm thinking is, all right. So you're talking about the average. You're talking about the entire industry, right? Only 10% cigarette smokers switch brands. You're talking about the entire industry. Out of these 100, only 10% do. But then... For example, what if, you know, this this 10% is, this these 10 people are all taken by one brand. For example, B promotes, B does advertising, etc. And B had only 10 customers before. And now all these 10 people have actually come to B only, right? What says that every company, the, the situation in every company has to be as per the averages. The average may not be applicable to everyone in the group, right? It's just the average, isn't it? Like, for example, when we talk about the average weight of a group, that does not mean that every person has that weight. It's just the average. People could have very different weights. Similarly, and this is one of our flaws that we've discussed, right? And the module as well. That average cannot be applied to every person. It doesn't mean just because the average of the group is something does not mean that every person will have the same value. So then... Of course, then this is a this is a different, right? Now, if 10 people, all these 10 new people actually came to B and B spent only 10%, that is only dollar two of its revenue, but it bought dollar 10 because 10 people would have brought in dollar 10. Then, of course, it did pay for B to um, uh, put up advertisements, right? To market, isn't it? So then, of course, each company is trying to put up better and better advertisements and better than their competitors so that they are able to attract out of these 10 people that's so that they're able to attract maximum people. So then, of course, we cannot say that it does not pay to advertise because for some companies, for some people, it could pay. For some manufacturers, it could pay, right? All right. So then... There, there is a flaw over here. We have identified it. Let's look at the options. You don't need to spend too much time on identifying the flaw. But, you know, some things like, for example, when, when certain words, when let's say if they're talking about averages and I'm going to ensure that it's not being used for each member or in case they're giving examples, it's not being generalized. Or, for, for example, the moment a necessary or assumption condition comes into play, then I know that I have to look out for it, right? Okay, let's look at the options now. Computing advertisement costs, advertising costs as a percentage of gross receipts, not of overall costs. Now, this doesn't really make sense. We should, in fact, you know, 
in any case, it doesn't matter, you know, what we're using as the base, but it certainly makes sense to use gross receipts because what part of the revenue goes and how much revenue gets added, and that is how we'll be able to compare whether marketing helps or not, right? As a percentage of overall cost, we wouldn't really know whether marketing is financially better for us or not, right? So certainly this is not the answer. This is not the flow. Past patterns of smoking may not carry over to the future. All right. So then is the uh, argument talking about the future? Is it saying that in the future, the companies should not market? No. Look, it says did not pay. It says it follows from these that inducing smokers to switch brands did not pay and that cigarette companies would have been um, no worse off economically. So they are talking about past only, right? My conclusion is talking about, well, this did not happen like this in the past. We are not talking about the future at all. We're not saying that this is how it will happen in the future also, isn't it? So then this is also not correct. Look at option C. The assumption that each smoker is loyal to a single brand of cigarettes at any one time. So first of all, there is no assumption that each smoker is loyal to a single brand of cigarettes. It's certainly possible that out of these 100 people, let's say, you know, five people smoke all the four brands. Doesn't matter. Of course, then they are not the ones switching from one brand to another. We just need 10 people to switch, right? So we don't need that. Each one of them should have one brand only. I mean, it's it's fine. There, they can easily be ten people who are switching brands. All right. Now, D. The assumption that each manufacturer produces only one brand of cigarettes. Again, this is not necessary. This is not a flaw. Um. So A, like for example, okay, let's say that A and B both are produced by one manufacturer, right? Now. When A is getting more people because of its promotion, is it pulling it from B or from others? We don't know. Well, we don't have that information at all. And also, let's say if it is pulling it from B, if the person that you know A gets because of the promotion is from B, then, well, it certainly makes sense that promotions are not good. I mean, they're not really doing you any good. Right? So then, if anything... It is going to strengthen our argument in case, uh, you know, there are multiple manufacturers, uh, one manufacturer multi um, selling multiple brands, right? So are we assuming that each manufacturer produces only one brand? It's not necessary. It's fine. A manufacturer can make more brands, isn't it? Whenever, anyway, when we have that there are these assumptions, each smoker, each manufacturer, you have to ensure, you have to think about it. Is it necessary that it should be true for everyone? Yeah. Okay, look at E. Figures for the cigarette industry as a whole may not hold for a particular company. So exactly what we were talking about, right? That the average may not lie to everybody in the industry. So some 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 uh, manufacturer might think that okay I'm going to make an absolutely brilliant advertisement and I will attract a lot of the market share right Th then that manufacturer needn't get just ten percent right so um yeah answer is E over here perfect okay great so I'll give you a few seconds let me know in case there are any questions now. Yes, so the assumption that each smoker, um, you know, such assumptions could be correct in some questions, most certainly. Look, it will certainly depend on the context. Um, the author could be making an assumption and, uh, you know, that could be the flaw as well. So, of course, assumption questions are flawed questions because, you know, when I say that this is a cogent argument, when I say that this I can derive from the data given, an assumption question, of, an important link is missing, right? So there is a flaw. And this is, as you um, have to be, as we've discussed in our module also, this is a flaw where an important link is missing. This is a flaw. So, of course, assumption question, then a default of flawed question. Right? And you could have an argument and there could be um, an assumption. And then, you know, that could be given as a flaw as well. Of course, it's certainly possible. 